Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the E3 podcast. I'm Melissa Johnson. Today, I have Dwan Twyford on. Did I, sp- did I say that right? I didn't. Mm, I it's Dwan Benton Twyford. Yep. Okay. So I'm so excited. This woman is amazing. I read her bio. She's done so many things, been so many places, written books, been a speaker. Um, why don't you share a little bit about you and what you're doing and, and the things you've done a little bit? Just kind of tell us who you are. Okay. Well, I'd love to. Well, thanks for, uh, ha- thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm always super excited to get a chance to uh, meet new people, be on new podcasts, and especially talk to the women out there. Yes. The girls, we like, we need to support each other, you know? Um, so basically I started investing in real estate about 30 years ago and there, there really were like no female real estate investors back then. Not, I mean, maybe like couples, but it was really far and few in between to find like another woman that was working along as, you know, a real estate investor. And so the long and short of it is um, I was married. I had a baby. She was eight months old. My dad and I kind of unexpectedly split up. And so now I have a baby. And I'm like, okay, I, I don't want to put her in daycare. I want to raise for myself, but I don't have any job skills. I don't have any education. I don't have, you know, any money. I don't have any credit. I have like nothing. <laughs> and real estate investing just sort of found me. And I did my first house. I made 22,000 bucks on my first deal. Nice. And, you know, and $22,000, you know, I always tell people like, that's so much money now, but that was so, so, so much money 30 years ago. But to have that and just like one lump sum in my bank account, I was like, gosh, I'm actually rich. (laughs) I'm rich. I've got money. And, and that was it. I just kept going and going and going and, I don't know. And then I started speaking and people asked me to write books and my husband and I got married. Uh, I didn't get married till my daughter was 13. So I was a single mom till she was 13. And my husband and I uh, are kind of rehabbing a whole entire town in Clinton, Iowa. So it's just been the craziest thing, Melissa. Like I never imagined on that first deal, I'd be where I'm at right. Like never was there any place in my mind that could conceive what I'm doing. Isn't that crazy? Like just that journey. Like I, I had the same experience too. I remember getting that first check and I think it was 20 something thousand also. Oh. And I was working just some like a desk job admin kind of job thing or whatever. And I remember that check seeing it and going, holy crap. Like this is my whole year's like take home pay in this one deal. Yeah. Like give yeah. me more. <laughs> And, you know, Ayla was born in 1988. So in the 80s, you know, I know you're a little bit younger than I am, but I turned 21 in 1980 and I was living in Fort Lauderdale. And so that was a very decadent, like I worked in the really fancy nightclubs and there was a lot of cocaine, a lot of champagne, a lot of partying. So I just kind of like partied, really partied my way through my entire 20s. And then when I got married, I thought, okay, you know, I'll stay home. I'll be a Susie homemaker. I'll have some kids. This will be fun. And so now I'm single and I really have no job skills at all. And, you know, I, there's no more crazy partying anymore. So now I'm a mother and I didn't even have, I mean, nothing. I didn't have, I had nothing to fall back on. Like I couldn't even have done admin work. I don't think I didn't, I had like nothing to fall back on. So when I got that first check, I just remember looking at that and calling my dad. And I was like, I have $20,000 in the bank. Like right now in the whole bank, I've never made that much in the whole entire year. Like this is the most amazing thing that's ever happened to me. And that was it. I just jumped on a second deal. I made like 30,000 on the second deal, but I made 50,000 bucks on my third deal. And I'm re- I'm, I'm moving into these houses with my daughter and I'm fixing them up mm-hmm. and I move into the next house and we're fixing, she's with me. And I did that by the third house. I was like, Oh my gosh, I have like, you know, like in the bank, like 50 grand. And I thought, how is this possible? This is the best thing that's ever happened to me ever in my life. I was so excited. And I just, I just couldn't imagine anything else I could do to make that kind of money and have Ayla with me every day. So Mm -hmm. I just kept rolling. Never expecting like this. I mean, I've got like three bestsellers and I've been on so much TV and podcasts and had my own show for a while. And I I was like, I don't even know how all that happened. (laughs) I just, I just know that this was, uh, it wasn't daycare and it wasn't a job where I had to, you know, uh, have somebody else tell me what to do. Yeah. So what, like 
how did you find out about real estate to begin with, you know, from doing, you know, working in bars and things like that? Was it like a late night infomercial kind of thing? Uh, well, you know, it's funny. I had seen Carlton Sheets. I don't know if you remember who oh, Carlton yeah. Sheets was. So I used to see those and I thought, huh, I'm like, I don't know, that might sound like, you know, like way before I even thought about real estate. But what happened, and, and that's why I always tell people, it's like, you know, I'm 62. So when I started, we didn't even have pagers. There were no cell phones. There were no computers. We didn't have anything that y'all have now. And the only way you could get a job was to look in the classified section of the newspaper. So there was a million jobs and I would go to these interviews and they were basically MLM, multi-level marketing was so giant. And every place you'd go would be a ballroom and be like 300 people there. And I was just like, oh my God, I need money. like now mm -hmm. so i started seeing kind of the same few people <laughs> going to these interviews and I, so i met these guys i'm like oh yeah we buy houses and we fix them up and we sell them and we buy cars and we fix them up and we sell them but we're interested in multi-level marketing and, and like i can totally see the value of multi-level marketing but i didn't have the time to like build up the down i mean i, I didn't i just didn't have that kind of time you know i was living on credit cards and so these guys, I'm like, okay, so tell me about this real estate thing. Because, you know, I see this thing on TV and, you know, you fix them up and you sell them. What does that mean? The guy, oh, yeah, we fix them up, we sell them. And so my mind, my mind thought that they were talking about decorating. <laughs> because I didn't, never knew the term rehabbing. So they tell me they fix up houses. I'm like, oh, so like carpet paint, custom made blinds, hang some pictures. I can't like this, like decorate and you just sell the house. So, so, so I really, from the bottom of my heart, I thought the first house, I was just going to decorate this house and make it beautiful. And that was going to be it. I was going to make money and life was, I was just going to decorate houses. And, and so I, they told me that where the foreclosures were at up in Palm Beach County, Florida. So I would go to the courthouse and I had to manually handwrite every single address. And to use this old map, people don't even know what these old map books look like. These old giant map books and map my way through these neighborhoods and knocking on doors and got a baby hanging on my hip. And, uh, and I put my first deal together and I really did not, I mean, really looking back, it's the craziest deal. And if one of my students did that, I would immediately jump all over them because we didn't have paperwork. I didn't know what I was doing. Like this woman, Barbara, we sort of like hugged and had a handshake. Like, yeah, we're gonna help each other out. And I mean, I had no documents. It was crazy. I didn't even have a deed or a power. I had nothing. I was just like, oh, okay. I'm going to take out. Ooh, you know. <laughs> well, hood top closing. Oh, my <laughs> God. I mean, honestly, looking back, it's like there's not even any paperwork on it. But she needed help. I needed a new career. And we worked on that first deal. We, I, did a, I actually did a partner split with a homeowner, like just verbally. We, we split the deal. And I was it's craziness. But um, when I got into the house, I did paint, I got blinds made, I bought plans, I bought pictures, I had new carpet put in. And I just remember standing there and looking around the house and being like, wow, this house still has like yellow countertops and avocado appliances. And I'm like, this house needs a lot more work than I'm a, a capable of doing. And I don't know how to do anything else. Like, I'm really like, carpet and paint was sort of the end of my skill set there. So I, for real, I would start going to Home Depot and they have all those free classes. And I started taking those classes and that's how I rehab my first house. Did you do I it yourself? I literally took a class and learned how to put in toilets. I'd go put, change the toilets. And I learned how to put cabinets together and Ada would be sleeping and I'd be putting together cabinets and I'd put the cabinets in. And I learned how to lay tile, lay <laughs> tile two bathrooms and a kitchen. <laughs> and so for like three years, I would just get a house, sell one, move into a new one, fix it, sell it. And we did that till she started kindergarten. And by that time I had the money to afford a couple houses. And of course I was meeting other people around town finally. So I had some guys that could do some rehab work for me and stuff. But man, I'm telling you what, I, I look back and it's really shocking to me how successful I became starting off as uneducated and naive as I was. You know, I, I think being naive was probably my best 
thing because if I really understood really what I was doing, I'm not sure I would have had the guts to do it. I agree. Sometimes you just got to jump, right? You yes. got to just jump and just do it. And yep. you just kind of learn along the way. Because if someone's like, oh, listen, you're going to be putting in tile and ceiling fans and changing electrical, I'd be like, no. First of all, no, because I'll break my fingernails. It's not going to happen. <laughs> and then I'll be dirty and sweaty. That's not going to happen. <laughs> and then there I am in there ripping off cabinets and tearing things out. And we had dump trucks coming and hauling things off. And I was like, I don't even know what happened right now. But it was really good. And, you know, I was, I was really, really mad at my ex. Like, really, really mad. And rehabbing a house was really good therapy. I bet. How many cabinets yeah. did you smash? All of them. <laughs> and then I'd get them on the floor and just like beat them with a sledgehammer so they were just like sliver. I was so mad. And yes. And I remember the very first cabinet, I was so trying to take it off with the, so gentle with the screws. I was like, you know what? I got a big crowbar and popped this cabinet. I smashed it. And next thing you know, like destroyed the entire kitchen. I was like, huh. Well, I feel a lot better. This is really amazing. This is the best therapy ever. <laughs> it feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Oh, I tore that house up. But it looked really good when it was done. It really did look good. I was really proud of my first deal. I wish back in those days I would have thought to take like before and after picture. It never even dawned on me. Mm -hmm. I was eight or nine houses in and someone's like, you just, don't you take pictures? And I was like, mm, no, because we had these little disposable cameras. We didn't have cell phones and otherwise you had to have like a big fancy expensive camera and I couldn't afford that so I probably didn't even start before and after pictures so I was like 10 houses in and I wish I had before and after of that first house because it really did look good <laughs> I know I, I try to do before and afters too but I mean even when I got started that was like 2003 that still even wasn't a thing you know like social yeah. media wasn't like what it yeah. is now and you know I might have taken like a couple of pictures of the outside or something, but I didn't really like document the process. I know. Cause you're just so in it, you know, you're trying to learn and you're trying to figure things out. And like, that's probably the last thing on your mind at that point. Yeah. And I, I really did the first one, especially because I did not know this either, but she was a hoarder. Ooh. So I did not know what a hoarder was really until those TV shows came out, like buried alive and hoarding, mm -hmm. which has been what in the last, five or six or seven years or something, I still all that whole entire time didn't know what a hoarder was. And she was a complete hoarder. And I remember just thinking like, oh my gosh, there's just these little tiny pads to walk around in this house and there's nowhere to sit. And there's like thousands of cans and cat food and wine bottles and papers and it's like stacked to this. And now looking back and having watched those shows, it stuns me that she moved out. Because I watch these people on TV that goes all kinds of crazy counseling, like throw away a piece of paper. So it stuns me that she actually just moved out of the house, <laughs> you know. And so I've done two houses, only two in all these years that were 100% hoarder to the ceiling. And I've done a couple of those myself. It is, um, it is an experience, right? Yes. Yes. My second hoarding house, we use six 40-yard dumpsters. Oh, my gosh. Six. 40 yard dumpsters full to the top. Wow. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Nothing. It was, and there were rats. And Ooh, <laughs> she had cats. Too. There was so much stuff in the house. I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. But it was a good deal. What, did she have cats? Um, so it was a guy. He had, he, and you know, and the other thing is, Melissa, this is one of the things I feel like. And I'm not saying that a male real estate investor wouldn't do this, but I feel like sometimes our, our, our naturally nurturing sense of a woman, um, this was a guy, his parents had died. He was only in his thirties or something. He'd left him the house, but he had some, a clear mental, um, this is some schizophrenia or something. Mm -hmm. And he was losing the houses because he hadn't paid the taxes. Well, and he was a hoarder and he had thousands of cans of cat foods and he had all this stuff, but he, and he understood that he was not going to have anywhere to live. And so I started talking to the guy and, you know, and he'd have these moments of lucidity and I happen to have an uncle who's schizophrenic. It's like I, I, I recognized. So I went over and above, like I found this guy, a caseworker. I helped him get on some disability and get into a, a living, like a group space. 
And I did this whole giant thing with this guy. So I thought, well, I can't take this man's house and make all that money. He's going to go live under the bridge right now. Like, how am I going to get blessed for that? And so I've had a few homeowners along the way where I've taken those extra steps like that because I couldn't just leave them. And not that a guy would just leave them. I feel like men are more like, ah, oh, yes, can they fix it up, you know, and just move on. And I'm looking at this poor guy and I'm thinking, where is he going to sleep? what's he going to eat? How I can't make 60 grand on this house and this guy has nothing. I can't give him the cash. He doesn't even understand. He had no electricity. He had no water. He doesn't even understand how to pay bills. He's been living like that for since his parent, like a decade mm -hmm. living yeah. in a house in Florida with like no water or power, anything. That's great. We had a couple like that too. And I like what you said. And I think that's important for the listeners to hear that too. Like that's a huge value add. You know, when people are in those situations, we've done the same thing too, where we've had to help. Um, we've done stuff for elderly people too, you know, yeah. like they need someplace to go or they need help moving, um, things like that. So like really going that, taking that extra step. Like we did have a guy that was, had some issues. He was elderly. He had nobody to help take care of him. He obviously yeah. could not take care of himself. And so we got like adult, adult social services involved and yes. Yeah, yeah, just trying to and get. See, I've done those things too, and people are always like, "Well, what'd you do all that for?" You know, and I'm like, "Well, <laughs> first of all, I believe I'm going to reap what I sow. So let's just start with that. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I can't just take this house and make all this money and just toss this person and never think about them again. Because you know, honestly, I mean, you know, I know this. When we're dealing in real estate and we're dealing in foreclosures, everyone that's in foreclosure is in foreclosure because something's wrong. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in foreclosure to start with. They'd be paying their bills and life would be great. So I feel like it's it's not just about helping that single person. It's like we're, we're put into a business where every single deal I buy is somebody that's in trouble. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we should always ask like the extra few questions. Like, where are you going from here? Where, who's going to help you? Do you have money to move? Not just, oh, some of your house. Okay, move out Friday. Woohoo! Yeah, we need to, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like all investors need to do that, but I feel like us as women especially, we need to take those extra steps and just make sure that this person is, is going to be okay. Right. Well, we're in the business of problem solving, right? Yes. And so that, you know, buying their house solves the problem for them, but going those extra steps, like, really helps solve the problem for them, right? Because yeah. like you said, like we, they might not know where to go or have anywhere to go or have anyone to help them to take care of them. Like, yeah. what are they going to do? And so I think, yeah. you know, taking those extra steps is, is huge. It really is. And I agree. I've done it and more, more times than it's sad because every time I have to help someone to that level, I'm like, wow, like nobody, like people just abandoned this person. Mm -hmm. Like, how am I the only person on the earth that can help this person? So I feel sad for them that they have nobody. Yeah. But, you know, it's part of that. Like, you got to feel good about it at the end of the day. And they get a fresh start. And, you know, I make good money, which is good for me. And, you know, allowed me to raise my kid and my family and do all kinds of crazy stuff. But I always did good right by the homeowners. Yeah. Always. Well, we're creating win-win situations. You know, yeah. we win and they win too. And I think that's... Yeah. And everything you do, like you said, I totally agree. It comes back to you. You treat people right and good things are going to come back to you too. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. So let's talk about um, what do you feel like is one of the biggest obstacles that you've had to overcome? Well, <laughs> for, for me personally, uh, learning how to rehab was a pretty giant obstacle because, you know, I did not really have the skills and I didn't have the money really, oh, I didn't have the money period to like, hire anyone to help me out. So learning the physical end, the physical end of fixing things up was a, an obstacle, but it was fairly easy to overcome. Um, learning paperwork and, you know, understanding the legal side of things like that took a minute. But honestly, the, the hardest thing is is once I was in it for a little while, the very first real estate RIA group started opening up in South Florida. So I go to this, you know, so RIA is R-E-I-A. So for all you that are maybe new, uh, it's Real Estate Investors Associations. And so there are RIA groups all over the country now, every city, there are meetups, they're just everywhere. Well, the very first one opened up down here in South Florida. And of course, 
in the classified section of the newspaper. I'm like, hey, a meeting for real estate investors. Ooh, I'm gonna go to that. And so I go to that and there's about 80 people there. And there's me and there's another woman and it's all men, all men. There's not a, just one other girl, Sharon. She and I actually ended up working together for about a decade. And there were, it was all guys. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I buy houses, I fix them up. And they're just like, <laughs> I'm like, what was that? And I had a really hard time, like kind of breaking into the boys club. Like, you know, if I had a house I wanted to sell, or maybe I like, you know, I learned how to wholesale. Mm -hmm. So I remember specifically one of the houses, I got it under contract and I wanted to wholesale it. I said, hey, it needs like this much in work. And, you know, it's a good, this is the price. And then these guys were sort of like, well, you know, how do you know how much it needs to work? I think you've over uh, exaggerated expenses. It just needs this. And you're making, you know, 15,000. You only need to make five. And my, and these men were trying to tell me my numbers were off. I didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, I was making 10 or 15,000 on a, on a wholesale was too much. Like five would be good for me. And what does that mean? Five is good for me. Wow. Like, would you do that for that? And I remember really having a hard time getting some of the people in town that I was newly meeting to work for me. And somehow, I don't even remember how it happened. Somebody, somebody called a newspaper down here, like the Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale, said, hey, there's this girl, these girls are rehabbing houses, you should do a little article on them. So they, like way back in the early 90s, they wrote this article about these two women that rehabbed houses. And I was like, oh my God, we're in the paper. Ah! And then all of a sudden, everyone in town's like, oh, so, you know, we do want to work with you now. It's like, oh, now, wow. because you saw it in the newspaper, but like a month ago, you, my numbers were bad. I couldn't figure out the profit on a deal. I was flipping houses for too much money. And, but it, it really took, it was a while. I mean, I, it, like the whole decade. It was sort of breaking. And even when I started training and uh, people started asking me to come and speak and teach at like, you know, multi-level places where there's, you know, three days and like 10 speakers, mm -hmm. I would almost always be the only woman. Do you feel that that's still going on right now? It definitely is. I mean, it definitely does. You know, women, clearly, we have made a mark and we've come a lot further. But still, in the real estate industry, Typically, if I'm asked to speak at some big event, maybe there's 15 speakers, I might still only be one or two of all the women and, and it's all the guys. And, and that's wrong with that. I just, I, I just, maybe I think that women don't, maybe sometimes think that they can just do it without a partner or a husband or, I think a lot of women just don't see themselves being single and being a real estate investor. Like they don't feel like it's something that they can achieve, even though they can. Mm -hmm. Or they are, and they are not talking about it. And that's yeah. the thing I've been finding a lot too. I feel like there are definitely more women out there doing this, Yeah. but there's so few like standing up and saying, Hey, I'm doing this. Like, you know, cause I think we're, we have a tendency not to be like, look at me, look at me. Or a man doesn't have so much of a problem with that. I feel like mm -hmm. I'm with you. Um, and I think that's, I mean, it's kind of on us, right? Like we should yeah. speak up more. We should put ourselves out there more. And, um, I was doing an interview earlier and we were talking about like people wanting to come on podcasts, you know, and a lot of people, their experience and stuff like that. But, you know, like for my podcast, I like to interview high level people and then people that are just getting started. So we can kind yeah. of dissect, you know, problems that they're going through because we've all been there. Yeah. You know, and going through and showing like you can do this and here's let's kind of coach you through like a, an issue that you're having but they feel scared they're like i can't be on a podcast because i haven't really done that much but it's like you have done some things and it's okay yeah. to talk about it tell everybody because you know if any just one person not you or me one if we can do it so can everybody else that's listening you know one of the things i really like is um back well obviously before covid uh, my husband and I, we normally speak at a RIA group about once a month still. I, I really still like to do, just for us, like we do a weekend, a live webinar, a, a live workshop. And I really like to mingle and talk and have people coming. And I've noticed over the last decade, especially when it's me and my husband, usually 50% of the audience are women now. 
and they're there and they're by themselves. I'm like, all right, girl, you can do it. Cause it used to always be guys or couples. Mm -hmm. And, but now there's so many women that come when they, they're like, Oh, I saw you and your husband. And I'm like, well, she started saying, I want to go learn about that. So I feel like there's just more and more women like coming, like you said, like kind of coming out of the woodwork and, you know, but I, I do love that at the live events when I see like half the audience is women. I'm like, oh, there are my girls right there. Those are my people. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny too. Like, I think there's more women going to these events, but again, still, like, how many of them are up on the stage? You know, I was scrolling through Facebook the other day and there was like some, another event, you know, and I'm looking at who's speaking. I'm like, there's not a single woman on here. And I feel like I'm seeing that over and over and over. And I think part of it is just whoever's organizing these events, like maybe they don't know enough women who are doing this kind of stuff again on us because we're not speaking up and putting ourselves out there as much probably. Uh And so we're not on the radar for this kind of thing. Or yep. if we are, we're like on a panel and all anybody ever wants to talk about is how do you do this? How do you manage when you have kids? And has anyone ever asked a man that question? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? you know what? That is such a good point. I've been on a million panels. No one has ever said to one single guy, how do you manage your family as an investor? Yeah. It's like, but people are like, well, how do you, how were you a single mom? It's like, well, I don't understand what that question means. What do you mean? How is that as a single mom? Like, what's the question? Like, how did I manage to have a career and a child at the same time? Oh my God, I don't know. (laughs) What kind of question is that? (laughs) I know. And I'm so tired of hearing that question being asked, you know, just because nobody asks a man, it's like, you just do it. Let's move on. You know, you just, you know, I'm going to, if you'll let me, I'm going to give out a really good tip for the women. So, um, so anyone that invests in my real estate program, you know, I do a little bit of basic coaching and, you know, I help them along. So I have had many women that have been like, you know, I got your program and they spent, you know, a thousand dollars and they're, and they're trying to do this and their spouse is not being supportive of them. So I had this one woman specifically, her name was Stephanie and She's like, Dwan, I got your program. And my husband said that, uh, you know, she stays home. She's like four kids, I think, three or four kids. She stays home with the kids, you know, she's a stay home mom. And she goes, at night, I want to go door knocking. I want to talk to people. And he says he won't babysit. I'm like, they're his own children. She says, now he says, when he comes home, he wants dinner. He wants to hang out. He doesn't want to babysit. He worked all day. So he would not watch the kids. I wouldn't help her. So I said, listen, let me tell you what we're going to do. I said, no, like basically how big are, <laughs> yeah, uh, how, how, yeah, how big are your balls right now? And she's like, no, I really want to do this. I, I just really want to do this. I want him to, because he had a job. He hated it. I want him out of his job. And I really want to do it. And I'm like, okay, so if you're all in, here's what we're going to do. So I said, you are going to find a babysitter. And when he comes home, you're going to make dinner. You're going to do whatever. And you're going to have the babysitter come and you're going to go out. So during the day, you're going to make phone calls, you're going to talk to homeowners, you're going to set appointments, you're going to go at night, and you're going to leave the kids with a babysitter in the house. She's like, oh my gosh, she'll have a fit. And I was like, well, do you have like your own money? Do you have an allowance? And she's like, yeah, I do. I said, okay. So this is, you have to stick to your guns on this. So during the day, because she had a couple kids in school and home, so she just really want to like drag the kids all around. So anyway, she gets a few appointments and the, a babysitter shows up. And she gets in a car and she calls, she's like, oh my God, my husband had a meltdown. He's like screaming at me, but I'm in the car. I'm going to go do this appointment. So she goes, I help her get this very first deal. And she, and she closed this deal and she made about 20 grand. I said, now here's what you do, Stephanie. What is something that your husband really, really wants? Like really wants so bad, but he really doesn't feel like he can afford it. So he wanted some kind of crazy expensive golf clubs. I don't even know enough about them to talk about them, but they were really expensive. So she had like this set of golf clubs, like his name engraved, like this whole thing. And she bought him a membership to this country club. Like he was almost the whole thing, almost all the money. Mm -hmm. She's like, Hey, thank you for helping. And, you know, even though he didn't watch the kids one time, not one time, she buys him his golf clubs. He goes golfing a couple of times and he's like, you know, maybe you could do another one of those deals. And just like that, after he got the golf clubs and went and played golf, he's like, you know, I wouldn't mind being home with the kids a couple nights a week if you want to do this again. And over the course of two years, she completely started bringing in all the money, was able to quit his job. And like they do real estate together. 
together. But he wouldn't even watch his kids. And I was like, no, nope, hire a babysitter and do it anyway. She's like, oh my God, we'll fight, he'll yell. And I was like, hey, then don't do it. You have, If you really want to do it, you're going to step your game up. And that's what I'm telling you to do. So I have had so many women. I was like, listen, just get a babysitter. Yeah. Because you, know, you have an unsupportive spouse. You either don't get to do it or you argue or you do it without help. And, you know, we need support, if we're, especially if we're married. And I've had a bunch of women do that, a bunch. Like, they're like, oh, I never thought about that. I was like, no, seriously. That's the tip. Tell all the women you meet. Yeah. Well, it's <laughs> a great let your spouse stop you. So now she did it. I had another woman and her husband wanted a big, giant big screen TV. They wanted to go on a cruise to Mexico. So she closed her deal. She bought this massive giant screen TV and took the family to Mexico on like a five day cruise. And she's like, he's so excited. He wants me to keep doing deals. <laughs> it's like if your man is telling you no and you're going to accept the fact that that person's allowed to tell you no. First of all, you need to get past that. But if that's where you're at, you know, I get it. We all have our different relationships. But you can't, you know, a man's not a plan. Mm -hmm. So you can't let that be, if you want something else for yourself, that, that's not your plan. You need to work. You want to be independent. And then just go do it and just figure out a way around it. So I have a lot of women now who have done that. It's like, I heard you talk. I got a babysitter. My husband had a shit, but I did it anyway. And look, I closed the seal and I bought him this. And now he's all behind it. And just like that, they like turn they change their tune. That's awesome. I love that idea. And it's so simple, <laughs> right? But it's something that you don't think about, you know, and especially oh. in the realm of working with spouses, you know, like yes. I know for me personally, like I didn't, I didn't have that issue so much as I couldn't manage all my stuff. So uh -huh. my spouse and I at the time, cause we're divorced now, but we work together and, but somehow it was still like on me to take care of the kids and still be an active participant in the business. So oh, uh, yeah. I had to hire a nanny or find the childcare or whatever to make that happen. Yeah. And it's, it's a little frustrating sometimes, isn't it? You know, it, just, it, it really is. And, and you know, the thing is for my poor husband, I was single for 13 years. So by the time I met him, I already had a custom built house. I had like 20 rentals. I had a car, I had a boat. Like I don't know this stuff going on. And I was like, now listen, not like some man just come in and wreck all my stuff here. So, <laughs> so this poor guy, he, he was the guy that literally was put through the ringer. <laughs> because I'm like, I don't need a man. I'd really like to be with you, but I, I do not need you. You are not my plan. I got my own plan. I got my own thing. So this poor guy, I mean, he probably had to jump through more hoops than any person I've ever even gone on a date with. Because I didn't want someone to come in and be... Especially because he was married, uh, his first wife was very traditional, stayed at home, kids, cooking, cleaning, you know, and just, and she loves that. And, you know, she still loves that stuff. I was like, if you're looking to someone to cook and clean and do laundry and like all that stuff, like, uh, it's not me. If we're going to have your two kids and me, and there's going to be five of us, we're going to have a live-in, we're going to have this and this and this. And if you think I'm taking on like those wifely women things then we're definitely not getting married because i don't even do those things now <laughs> and it's just me and my daughter so i'm certainly not doing it for five people and because you know his wife before and you know god love her but she's married again but she's that woman that like cooks three meals a day and she's always making things from scratch and you know she loves planting and taking care of the chickens and but it's like that is just not me at all so i had and i knew that bill is a is a little old fashioned that way. So we did it for a long time. I think, now listen, you need to be 100% certain because I need you to fully understand. Like, don't be looking at me when laundry needs to be done. This is not happening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not, not going to the grocery <laughs> store and schlepping up bags of groceries you know, up in the mountains at 9,000 feet. For So we hired and we had, we hired a, a house manager, lived in, and ran the kids around to doctor's appointments and cooked all the meals and did all the stuff. And I was like, oh, okay, see, this is nice. And it was really good, but <clears throat> he, uh, you know, had never been or dated a businesswoman. And I'm like full on at this point. I've already written a book. Mm -hmm. Like <clears throat> I'm full on businesswoman and I'm not, and not that, again, I always tell women, listen, if that's your gig and you love that, you need to do that. But that, like my sister, she's sad she passed away from breast cancer. 
But when she was alive, she lived out in the country and she had goats and chickens and, and she grew an orchard and she planted and she would like grind up flour from scratch. Like she loved all that stuff. She loved it. She could not understand why I wanted to be a businesswoman. And I would look at her and be like, I can't believe you have a bag of flour and you're like grinding it up to make a loaf of bread. Just go buy it at the store already. <laughs> like I don't understand it. And so, you know, and it's just different things for different people. But I just really needed to make sure that, that my husband understood that this is who I am and these are clear boundaries and guidelines. And, you know, if you're thinking something else is going to happen, it's not. And he was okay with it. But there was a few times he's like, oh, would you make me something to eat? And I was like, no. You, you got legs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you go in the kitchen. Why are you in there? Make me something to eat. <laughs> so. I had to be a little bit stern in the very beginning because I could see him like, yeah, I was like, listen, don't even be doing that. <laughs> That's what that girl right there is for. If she's done working for the day and you want something, you go right in that kitchen and you help yourself. But, you know, I think sometimes that as women, I think we just need to stand our ground sometimes. But it's hard to do because I still feel like we're stuck in the Cinderella, Prince Charming's going to come along and and save, solve all of our problems. And I feel like we're still raised that way. I agree. You know, I've got four daughters. And so like my mission in life is to raise them to be strong, independent women, you know, and it's like, <clears throat> the way you don't need the man in your life. The man that you have in your life is the one you want in your life, but you don't depend on this person to take care of you. And that's two totally different things. Exactly. You know, so teach them that a man is not a plan. Yes. I love that. They, it's like my husband. I love him in my life. I love being married to him. I adore this man, but I did not need to be married to live. Right. And I have, you know, now I have with my husband's kids was three of them. So I have a boy and two girls. And I was like, listen, so I raised those girls to be super independent. I'm like, now if you find a man, you want to get married, that's awesome. But don't even be thinking like, oh, I'm just going to have to be a housewife and raise kids. And like, that's just not, unless that's what you want. Right. But don't be stuck. Yeah. And I think every individual needs to figure that out. And then if you do want to do that, fine. If you want to be a businesswoman, fine. And if you need to delegate things out, yeah, do it. I mean, I do the same thing. I have somebody to clean my house, that clean my pool, that does the yard. And it's yeah. not because I'm like some, you know, rich and famous person or anything like that. It's just, what is my time worth? And my time is better spent working on my business and helping people yeah. than it is, you know, scrubbing my shower out it know? is and i always tell Not people I, I say listen wealthy people don't clean their own house they don't mow their yard they don't it's not that they don't want to or don't like to like so, you know like i i know a few people my daughter-in-law she loves to clean because it's like therapy she just you know and i'm just like girl <laughs> she cleans her house every day the whole house i'm like oh my god but she really loves it but it's like, if you're going to pay someone, whatever, even if it's 20 bucks an hour to clean your house and it takes them, you know, you spend a hundred bucks on the day, what could you do during those five hours that, and how much more money would you bring in for yourself if you didn't do those tasks? Mm -hmm. So my girl, you know, Colorado, we have like a 7,000 square foot house. Well, this girl takes her eight hours for, to clean the house. And it's like, well, if I spend eight whole hours of the day, I get you know, that little bit of money, I could have done something else so much more productive. Right. And, you know, like I was telling you, you know, here, you know, we have a yard guy. And it's like, I'm not going to go out and mow the yard. It's not that I don't want to. I'm not too good for it. I did all those things. But as I started making money, I started hiring those things out so I could use my time better. Right. Because, you know, paying someone an hour to do this versus you having an hour, like to do a call like this. And then someone hears one little thing and Next thing you know, they're like, hey, Melissa, oh my God, I, I hired a babysitter. That tip you guys gave us and this one hour could be impactful to thousands of people. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I feel like people need to put a little more value on their time. It's like my, my ex is that guy that will drive like across town to buy gas because it's two cents cheaper. It's like, dude, but you spent so much gas getting over there and back. It's not cheaper. It's the same price now. Right. <laughs> like, why do you do that? Was it worth and it? It's like, it's like people, I feel like people have kind of that, oh, I got to go over here because this is on sale. It's two for one. But if it takes you three hours to get over there and back, what did you save? Exactly. Well, you your time nothing. is, 
your time is worth it's valuable it's valuable as an entrepreneur and you have to realize that and you have to build your your life your business around that knowing yeah. the value of your time yeah i just so, don't think people put enough value on their time I, I just i feel like women less so than men even i agree i agree and i think we all fall into that trap at some point or another we do when you kind of wake up and realize that's what's happening now it's like what are you going to do about it right yeah, no, I'm with you. Because, you know, even now, like women, you know, with the same exact job as a man, they still make less money. Yeah. Well, why is that? Because society still values our time less because we should be homemakers. Right. And, and we're not speaking up. It's, it's the 21st yeah. century. It's still how it is. Yep. So what do you feel like has contributed the most to your success? Um... You know, honestly, I feel like the main thing was just the fact that, that I was raised with my daughter by myself and her dad was like completely out of the picture. And I, I feel like I, especially initial, initially, I was so worried about being broke again or not having money or having to rely on somebody, not even a man, just anyone, like my parents or just anybody in general. So I feel like I, for like a decade, I really had that, that sort of ride or die attitude of like, hey, I got to make this work. I have to keep working just because I have some rentals doesn't mean I can lose them all. Like, I just kept, like, I didn't ever want to go back to that low point in my life. So they always say that people work away from pain and like towards pleasure, like that's kind of, you know, so I was always working away from the pain. Like I never wanted to be here again. So I just kept going and getting further and further separating myself from that. And I mean, a decade before finally I was like, okay, I feel like I can take a minute now yeah. <laughs> because I just didn't want to ever be back, you know, in that situation. Like when my ex took off, my parents were like, well, you can come and move back home. And I was thinking like, oh, <laughs> move back in with my parents, with my daughter, I'm 30 years old. Like, I don't want to do that. Right. But I didn't have any job skills. I didn't have money. And I was like, oh my gosh. That's like, to me, that'd be like the walk of shame, you know? Yeah. And um, so I really think that part of my motivation was just really making sure I never found myself back in those shoes again. Yeah. I, I had read something recently. I was talking to one of my clients about it too, about how the fear of loss is typically greater than the fear of success. Mm -hmm. So you will work harder at something because you're afraid you're going to lose it versus working hard to achieve success. Do you yeah. feel like that was kind of where you were at? I do. Now that you say it that way, I do because my main thing was like, I never wanted to be stuck in a situation again where I was caught so off guard. I mean, I was really caught off guard by the whole thing. And so I thought, okay, well, how do I never let that happen again? And then I started doing well and making money and you know, accumulating rentals and accumulating some wealth and things like that. And then when I met my, my husband now, we've been married 19 years. So, you know, it's those 13 years of me being single, I think got me through my man hating years. <laughs> <laughs> I had some clear man hating years right there for a minute. Ah, and, but also just like having my own self worth and value at that point, I think has, has made me, be a good wife and enjoy being married this time around. But even then I still wanted to keep separate bank accounts, separate things that I thought, well, if something happens, I still could find myself back over there someday. And I don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. So it took me a really long time for us to have any, anything mutual, anything for, I mean, a long time. So I was like, well, you know, still though, you could still run off and like, you know, I feel like this is not happening, but I didn't think that was going to happen either. And there was just a piece of me for a long time, like five, six years in. Where I was like, no, 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 you, you keep this. I'm keeping that. I'm keeping the, you know, we're going to buy stuff. You can have stuff in your name. I'll put something, you know, we don't have all this joint stuff. And it took me, it took me a little bit of time to, to get past that. Because even, you know, you can still have 50 rentals and find yourself completely bankrupt. So, yeah. It doesn't mean just because you have them now, you're going to have them tomorrow. And um, so I just, I guess I did. I just really spent all that time making sure I didn't end up back over here in the beginning. So I agree. And that is a hard thing, like all of it, like letting go, right? Or like letting somebody in. So that's, 
with spouses too, because I had the same issue too. And I actually still am, I like, I've always been that way. I keep my stuff separate. You know, I have my money and my things and like, I just prefer it that way because I always feel it in which might not be, a, I don't know if that's good or bad, but I, you know, I don't know either. It's a I remember Bill and I opened our very first corporation together and I was like, well, let's do like 60, 40, 60, me, 40, you. I said, no, we're going to do 50, 50. I'm like, mm, I don't think so. And so the very first time I was like, all right, you know what? We're going to open this up. We're going to do 50, 50, we're going to buy some rentals. And it was a really big thing for me because I thought, wow, at 50, 50, I don't have control. Mm-hmm. He doesn't either, but I don't either. And, and it was a big deal. Like, I remember thinking like, wow, I'm I, like, you know, am I getting soft over here? What's going on? And I was like, no, 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 I'm married. I'm married for life. Like, I know God brought me this man. I know I'll be with him till the day I die. Like I knew all of that, but there was still a piece of me that didn't want to ever own anything unless I own more than 50% of it. <laughs> I feel that, especially now it's, you know, once you go through a divorce or something like that, it's kind of like, that was a mess to untangle. You yeah, know, it was. because of the, the joint ownership and everything and trying to figure yeah. out who gets what and what's fair. And, you know, when you build something over a long period of time and then trying to dismantle that in a way that, you know, is fair for everybody, it's really hard to do. It's hard. And it's funny because now we sort of joke, because you know, we've been married 19 years. So when we have a great relationship and we're rehabbing an actual town, like where the town he's from, we bought 15 buildings and we're doing this whole downtown renovation. And so we always make jokes like, listen, we can't get divorced because nobody can figure this stuff up. We just have to stay married because we have too much stuff together. So it's, it's easier for one of us to die. <laughs> and people are like, that's not funny. And I'm like, no, seriously, it'd be easier if one of us died than trying to split anything up. We just, we have to stay married because it's just the easier path. <laughs> That's one way of looking at it, right? Yeah, but you know, we're going to stay married because, you know, we really, truly love each other. But honest to God, I was like, Lord have mercy. If we ever had to untangle all this, it'd take years. Yeah, it, it gets, it gets hairy. <laughs> so that's our joke. It's like, hey, nobody walks out of here alive. If anything happens, <laughs> love is going brown. That's the only way to make it easy and fair for everybody. It's just the only way to do it. <laughs> That's well, good, I think, when you can laugh about those things. Right. <laughs> I want to wrap up with, with a final question. Um, for anybody that's getting into real estate, and this, this episode feels really been about just, like, what have you learned? Like, this is 30 years of experience that you've got here, and this is, like, life experience. You know, you've been in real estate, but this is all, like, life, too. So yeah. for somebody getting started, what would be a key piece of advice for them to know going into this? You know, honestly, when I look back at when the way that I started, I was very much influenced by people around me. And I did not have anybody that was like, hey, yay, go become a real estate investor as a single mom with a kid. That's a great idea. I, I was very heavily influenced by my parents, my family, my friends. They had a lot of naysayers. Well, you can't just do that. Like women just don't do that. You can't do that. But I did it anyway. And I feel like you can get all the education, you can learn the forms, you can learn all these things like that. But if you let the people around you into your head, I don't think that you can, I don't think a lot of people can separate themselves out and go become successful anyway when they don't have anybody rooting for them. Mm -hmm. So I feel like if they just always know like you and I are rooting for them and that they can do it and not let the naysayers because other people in your life, they, they want you to be happy, but people don't really want you to break off and become successful. They really don't. Deep down, they don't. They think that they do, but they really, truly don't. So I feel like if you can just honestly get rid of the naysayers, or at least don't let them into your head, you can really accomplish anything. If you can think of it, you can do it. You know what? That was, I, that was the very first thing I did after, uh, no, not my first deal, because I lived in these rehabs for a while, but when I moved into my first house that I was going to stay in, I thought, you know, the thing I hate the most is I hate housework. And I always tell people, I try to think of something, like, what could you do if you're brand new? What would be something that would make you feel that you might be on the path to success? And so for me, I don't know, maybe I'd gone to a center and heard someone say that. And I thought, you know what? If I had a housekeeper, 
I would feel like I was on the path. I could hire a person to clean my house for me. So the very first thing I did when I was able to like hire something done is I hired a girl to come and clean my house. Just one time a month is all I had. Mm -hmm. And then after I did a few more deals, she came twice a month and then she started coming every week. Then the next person I hired was someone to do all my yard work. And then I was like, oh, I have a housekeeper and I have someone to do my yard work and the housekeeper does my laundry. I was like, I am on the way. Like those <laughs> things made me feel that all my, so many hours of working on houses and sweat and labor was like worth it because I was able to finally hire a couple things out. But my housekeeper was the first thing I hired. My first person I ever hired for anything like that was a housekeeper. Nice. I think mine was, was a nanny. I hired a nanny, but I had a huge need for that at the time too. Well, with four kids too. You yeah. Know, I was just the one child. And by that time she was in school. And so but I was just like, oh my gosh, I have a housekeeper. I'm right on the counter. I'd be all excited when she'd come, you know. And now I have you know, one here. I have one in Colorado. I have one in Iowa. I'm just like, hey, I'm coming to the house in like a week. Get in there and clean that. And make sure it's spot, fill up my fridge. And, and it's just so nice. It's just so, and it's not, you know, even a big thing, but it's just nice that I don't have to do it because I don't enjoy it. Right. And well, and you built your business into a lifestyle business to where you can yeah. come and go as you please. And things are still happening. And I think that's yeah. really important for people to know too, like building your business around what you want your lifestyle to be. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you have to do that. There's nothing wrong with having someone, you know, clean your car, clean your house, do your laundry shop. I mean, if you love those things, like my husband, for real, he loves to grocery shop. He goes up and down. I'm just, I'm the person that goes in and gets like the five things on my list and I leave. He walks up every aisle. He's like, it's so relaxing walking up and down the aisles. I'm like, oh God, I hate to grocery shop. We don't even shop together for a decade because I'm like, listen, just get these five things and let's go. But he literally enjoys it. And he looks at new things, reads labels. And I'm like, he'll spend three hours. I'm just like, dude, oh, man. how can you be in the grocery store that long? Well, I just like seeing all the new things. And like, it really is a relaxing, methodical thing for him. So I'm just like, okay. Here's the stuff we need. Go have at it. I'll see you back in eight hours, whatever you need to do. You go have fun <laughs> with that. I am definitely not going unless we're going in and out. Because walking an aisle after aisle after aisle, looking at all the food, everything, I'm so anxiety ridden by the time I get out of there. I'm just like, you're killing me over here. We've been in the store for three hours. Nobody needs to be in the grocery store that long. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it causes me terrible anxiety to just stroll, but now I can go to the mall and stroll around the mall all day. Oh yeah. But grocery store, no, it's not happening. So my husband does the grocery shopping for the household and he loves it. Good for you. I hate grocery shopping too. So oh. if I can delegate that out, it's happening. <laughs> I love, I'm Instacart. Well, when I'm here in Florida, I have Instacart. But see, we live in the mountains of Colorado. Uh, we live so far from the grocery store, they don't have Instacart yet. So one of the things I love about being in this house, because you know I'm right here by the beach and on the, the lake is right out that door right there. The first thing I do is I call Instacart. I'm like, ah, Instacart's bringing my food. He's like, just go get it. I'm like, are you kidding me? They deliver it and put it into my kitchen for me. Why would I go get it? Exactly. Instacart's the greatest invention ever. <laughs> Anything deliver. I'm all about it. Grub, uh, DoorDash. <laughs> oh, me too. I'll call Instacart for like three things. Like, I can't believe you did that. I'm like, but I don't have to go out and get it. And you know, it's so yeah, I am so excited when I'm closer to things like DoorDash and because we don't have any of that stuff in the mountains. So if you want something in the mountains, you have to actually physically go get it. Wow. <laughs> well, this has been great. Um, I understand you have, do you have a freebie for, for the listeners that you were? I do, I do. If, uh, so my podcast is called the most wonderful real estate podcast ever. So if y'all just go to dwanderful.com, D-W-A-N-D-E-R-F-U-L, dwanderful.com, uh, and just opt in. I've got four free eBooks, and one is about wholesaling, short sales, some scripts, and a little bit of rehabbing. It kind of just exposes people to a bunch of the things that are there, mm -hmm. you know? And then I, I do a lot of uh, weekly on Mondays. We do motivational Mondays, so we do a live webinar every Monday and just, I'm all about teaching, educating and helping people. And so y'all yeah, just want to go get some free stuff, jump over there and get it and ask questions. We're here to help. Awesome. We'll, we'll put that link in the show notes and thank you so much for your time today and sharing and teaching us, you know, talking through uh -huh. 
those 30 years of experience, there's just, there's so much, right? You can't even like begin to talk about all the things you learn in this business over that oh, amount of time. But I don't even know if I talked about it for a month, 24 hours a day, there's still be more stuff to talk about. Right. <laughs> I just think people just need to just do it. Like really, they just need to take the step forward, just do it. Don't let people stop you. And don't let other people, you know, push their limitations onto you. I agree. Well, thank you again so much. Okay, thanks, Linda. Thank you, everybody.